Hi, Dennis Ward here at Holfa Studios for Holfa College. And today I'm going to do a video, but not a reaction video, but rather an analysis video from a song of a band that I really, really ad admire and have loved for years since I was a kid growing up in uh, Alabama. Um, the band is called Rush. The song is called Red Barchetta. Uh, let's just get straight to it. All right, this song from the album Moving Pictures, Rush, uh, is called Red Barchetta. The songwriters were, of course, Lee, Getty Lee, Neil Peart, and Alex Lifeson. Rolling Stones listed the song as number five on their list of the 10 best Rush songs. Uh, yeah, it's up there with me too, I gotta admit. Produced by Rush and Terry Brown. Paul Nordfeld was doing the engineering, and as far as I know, it was also mixed by Terry Brown um, because the whole thing was definitely recorded and mixed from October till November in 1980 at Le Studio. And then it was mastered by Bob Ludwig. Also remastering was done by Bob Ludwig. And um, of course he's renowned for all my favorite records. So let's get right to it and have a listen. I can't listen to a song from this album without first mentioning how amazing the sonics are. They, it sounds so good. That bass drum, um, I mean, I, I really don't know how they did that. It's not just a great bass drum sound, it's so powerful. It's obviously been done with some, some um, close mics inside and probably outside of the bass drum too. It just sounds so like in your face, but not the, the typical bass drum sound where microphone inside the drums and just, you know, powerful, but not, not real. It sounds like I'm standing next to a really nice, powerful bass drum. Um, I remember reading uh, that Peart was really into uh, the police, the band, the police uh, at, at that time. And he really liked the drum sound. And I think it had a lot to do with their very dry, very punchy snare and bass drum sound that they, uh, tried to get on this record. And I'm always amazed every time I hear how clear this thing is. 1980 people, no Pro Tools. This was done on great gear and great gear and great musicians and nothing else. And it's still phenomenal. <laughs> I love the wide guitar sound. There's some kind of effect on it, some kind of very wide modulation that's just making the spread like massive. It gives it even more transparency, it's even more 3D. But I always have to mention that bass sound. This album was for me bass sound. That, this one in Signals, I gotta admit Signals was very impressive too. The bass sound, this driven sound, this, this, this nosy but aggressive and very warm, Always there, present bass sound. I, I'm just so in love with it. That's Ampeg for you. And uh, I think he was using his um, jazz bass that he says he uses for a lot of stuff. I remember watching a video where he was playing the jazz bass, even though everybody seems to put him in relation with his Rickenbacker thing, which actually, as I read, he didn't use that much for recordings, more for uh, some live stuff. But that bass sound, phenomenal. Slows across the borderline. 
Got to point that out too, vocal sound. Nothing special, there's a little slap back on it. It's not really wide, it's not magnificent. But what I really like is there's a dynamic there. It's not compressed to death like everything is these days. There's a movement, there's a dun 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 and it's like pumping out at the right spots. Never too loud when it shouldn't be too loud. And it's down when it should be down. This is called just, you know, stopping your peaks instead of crushing, compressing, so everything that's really quiet is as loud as everything that's louder. So, and I'm a big fan of this kind of uh, style. Uh, I, I love that vocal sound. They, you know, they're, they're more into their music, it seems like, sure, but I, I still like his voice, and I've always really appreciated how they put his voice in the center and made a big attraction about it without being overblown or too ridiculous and not plastic at all. On that vocal thing again, you'll probably notice there's this echo behind the vocal. Now, I know a lot of people that do this. I do it too, but not as much as I hear it actually in the world. Um, and that's putting an echo on the vocal or guitar or whatever, and not on a quarter or an eighth in the actual tempo of the song, but more on a dotted note. So it's always like falling behind, making a false rhythm or actually making an interesting sustain to the vocal. I, I like it sometimes and sometimes I don't. I gotta admit, I tend more not to do it. I prefer quarters and eights when we're talking about a normal 4-4 song. And this one has also a lot of these triplet or, or dotted eight notes, fall offs of echoes. Um, I just found that be interesting because I know a lot of people that like to do that. Wow, again, the separation, the clarity, just, just mind-blowing. For many years, I used to use this album as like a listening template when I was setting up drum sounds. I wanted to get close to that bass drum and that snare. I, I always thought this is the best dry rock drum sound I've ever heard, and you can do anything with a sound like this. You know, having heard it again after a, a long time not hearing it, it's just great the way it is, and I'm sure it's not just a matter of putting a microphone somewhere and then saying, yeah, we've done it and it's all great. Um, they've done some fine tuning and, you know, use some stuff and uh, there's some compression going on and they pushed the tape and maybe, you know, did a little bit of gain staging here and, you know, turned up the gain on a preamp and let it squash a little. There's stuff involved. Um, but mainly it's just good judgment. And having good judgment is so important when you're recording a song. If you don't like what you've recorded and think you're going to fix it later with a plug-in or turning a knob or something, You've lost already. You're not gonna get it. Big flange. Rush off time classic. How does it go? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen. One, Okay, seven, eight. No one does it like that. Cool with splitting the vocals left and right. Wow. I love that wide solo. It's it's like 
a flange kind of a tunnel where it's, you know, it's a flanger, but it's not modulating. So it's like a standing flanger. It's a little different on the left, maybe some, some delay between left and right to give it this very, very wide spread. I'm not really sure how it was done. I'd like to figure it out. But uh, cool, cool, you know, Rush was all about Sonics, and uh, that's probably why I've always been so attracted to them. Okay, that's a really cool solo, and I wanted to point out a couple things that I hear that I think they're doing like this. For a start, the good old standing flanger. So we have our solo. That's our solo with nothing on it, nice and dry. Now, I could put a flanger on it, typical flanger that would sound something like this. It's flanging around, you know, however you want it to flange. Um, I'm going to turn the regeneration all the way up, and I'm going to turn off this width so that it doesn't really modulate. Now you hear that? It's got this kind of sound like there's a guitar player inside a concrete tube. It's a neat effect. I haven't heard it being used very often. I used to be a big fan of this. Van Halen would do stuff like this. Now, the other thing I hear is this wide effect. Now, I'm assuming they didn't have the H3000 from Eventide back then, but they would have probably had this one, this H910, which was their first successful harmonizer, as far as I know. I used to own this thing, but not with this keyboard, but uh, just this top part here. And it was pretty neat. We used to do stuff with this that was um, interesting. You could widen stuff up. You know, it was a pitch shifter. But one thing that we would do that I liked a lot was just, you know, setting it up like this, basically out of the box, so to say, or in default preset. It's not really doing anything, but it does make sound and it has a bit of delay to it. So if we pan this flanger rather all the way to the left and this all the way to the right, now I'm sending the guitar, this flange guitar sound, I'm sending into this device. And to point out again, this flanger is then panned all the way to the left, and this harmonizer is panned all the way to the right. And then we get this effect. You know, nice and wide, very cool. The middle is left free. There's probably other ways to do this, but um, I think that's how this was done. Great melodic bass notes. The way the drums and bass lock, phenomenal. This isn't jamming, this is working it out. Funny, um, listening again and be being also a fan of, of uh, The Police and uh, Message in the Bottle, songs like that, I remember listening to the guitar as well and thinking that, you know, it sounds like there's a, a wide spread on it. It's not really doubled. It's like it's electronically spread. And here I'm, I'm hearing the same thing. And, and the more I, I listen to it, the more I think about Police, I realize how influenced the Sonics really were from the police. The police sounded a lot more uh, underground, a lot more dirty, if you want to put it that way. And this sounds a lot more polished and, and perfect, but still I, I hear that they were influenced. They were definitely influenced. And that's actually a very cool thing because police are great. Love those flash of layover dubs. That's cool. 
lot of drive in the bass, but um, that was his signature sound. Very nice. Very, very nice. And now we have the fade out. Nice and slow and long. <laughs> Rush didn't do a lot of fade outs, as I remember. If they did, they usually faded into something else and just made a long song out of it. But um, oh, it was great to hear this again after so long. So, hope to see you guys again real soon. Thanks a lot for checking out our analysis slash reaction video. Come check us out at hofa-college.com. Until next time, see you around. Take care.